My name is Clint Patton Sr. and I am um, a private, have a private practice here. It's called it's Patent Behavioral Health. I'm also the founder of the Ashley Ashley Renee Hamilton Foundation. Um, my I have been working with uh, at-risk children and adolescents since 2007. So I would, I mean, what else am I supposed to do today? Just talk about it. Go ahead into it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was going to do it. it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well. Um, over the years, I've had several different um, uh, parents who have had trouble uh, parenting their kids, and I've had, they seem to be exhausted. It feels like nothing that they do is working to get the child or the adolescent to change their behavior. So uh, one thing that I've noticed that helps to alleviate some stress of parenting at-risk kids is um, establishing or re-establishing a relationship. And a relationship has to have mutual respect. And I know that some of us as parents believe that we're just because they are the child, they should automatically give us respect. Um, that is not true. Um, we, will, we should, as parents, it's very imperative that we teach our children how to respect others outside of the house and inside of the home by showing them the respect that we want them to give. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't have the authority and that you're not the parent. It just means that you are um, uh, using creative ways to uh, parent your child in a way that leads them to becoming successful. Uh, we have, a lot of us have been taught parenting techniques that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And those parenting techniques have often led our children to the grave and they have led our children to, uh, children and adolescents to uh, a lengthy criminal uh, justice record. So what I would like to do today is talk about ways in which we can, um, innovative ways in which we could parent our children so that they're no longer at risk and that they're thriving in a society um, built for them to win. So one thing, establishing the relationship, that means um, making sure that you are open for communication. That means not um, overreacting or acting in a dramatic fashion when your child is trying to, to speak to you. That is allowing your child to to express his or her, his or her emotions. Um, that is uh, one thing is as a parent, we, we also have to make sure that we are getting the help that we need for our childhood trauma um, so that we don't traumatize our children. And it's very easy to do because sometimes when we are raised in chaos or raised in trauma, we begin to think that trauma is normal. We, be, be, we begin to become comforted in trauma. So one thing I would do as a parent, if I know that I had a troubled childhood, it is my duty and my responsibility to get the help that I need to make sure that I'm not traumatizing my own child. Okay, so now, one way, another thing is we have to watch how we're speaking to our child. We have to watch how we're speaking to our adolescents. That means that if we want, we don't want them to become defensive when we start to talk to them. We want them to be open to communication as well. So that means refrain from uh, closed-ended questions, and those questions are yes, and questions that they can answer with a yes or a no. So an open-ended question is something that will uh, pretty much ask them for feedback and let them express what they feel. Um, another thing, when I talked about respecting your child, I know in our communities that we're not Taught, we're taught that a child is supposed to listen regardless of what we're saying. That is not true. We have to respect our child and we have to establish the relationship again. Respecting your child is um, doing things that's not going to break their spirit. Doing things that's not going to break their spirit or harm them emotionally. Um, there are excessive levels of emotional abuse that transpires within the, within the home in some of our, and some of our, and within our community. And those are, the emotional abuse has scars that uh, are the hidden scars, the ones that you can't see. So what happens when you 
find out or figure out that your child has been emotionally abused. Again, you go back to the basics and, and try to <clears throat> reestablish that relationship. Your child will automatically will respect you once they know that you're giving them respect because children learn by what they see before they learn by what you say as a parent. So if you want your child to be respectful, then you have to show that child respect. If you want your child to be respectful to themselves, you have to show your child how you respect yourself. Um, another thing is we want to refrain from blaming our child or child or adolescents uh, for the, the dysfunction in our family. We don't want to make them the scapegoat. We don't want them to feel like everything that everything that, that, that they do is a problem because what happens is they don't have the confidence and it takes confidence to learn. So what happens when we strip our, strip our children or adolescents of, trauma, of the confidence within the household, then they go to school and they don't have the confidence needed to learn. They don't feel confident in their abilities. And that's one thing that'll make a child act out as well. Um, things like sexual abuse. Your child will be open to speaking to you about, uh, about sexual abuse if they feel comfortable speaking to you, period. That means they know that you're open and you're not going to overreact and uh, make them feel like they made a mistake or you're going to blame them. Another thing that I would like to speak to talk about is encourage your kids to make mistakes so that they can learn. Encourage your kids to make mistakes so that they can learn. Now, of course, we know there's mistakes that are life-threatening. However, we want them to make the healthy mistakes that they can learn from so they can make them uh, learn how to make, you learn how to overcome or be resilient when it comes to mistakes. Another thing, children, uh, the children that I've dealt with often feel like they're not wanted. They often feel like no one cares about them. Um, and I know that sometimes we feel like our children are playing the victim. But what happens is, like I said before, our kids learn by modeling and they've watched the parent do the same type, the same thing. And as a parent, we have to be aware of those things so that we are not placing our kids at a disadvantage. We place our kids at a disadvantage when we do not receive the mental health uh, counseling or services that we need as parents because a lot of us have came, have, uh, came from uh, um, troubled childhoods or past that may be tainted a, a bit. However, there are some children who can be resilient or appear to be resilient physically, but they have emotional um, issues that need to be worked out. There's like you have the, the celebrities and the celebrities and the athletes, everybody, you look at them and they, oh, they're so successful. They have so much money, but they're dying inside because of the childhood that they had. And it's time for us to, as a community, we need to work together collectively to make sure that we're giving our children the best opportunity to succeed. So one, get help for your childhood trauma, admit that there's a problem and get help for it. Two, be open for communication with your child. Do not over-dramatize uh, your child when he says something to you, he or she says something to you. Um, three, make sure that you are building the relationship with your kids. Um, four, make sure that you are respecting your child as, as respecting your child like you would want them to respect others in the community. Five, make sure that you're respecting yourself so that your child will learn to respect themselves as well. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is love. Give your child the love that he or she needs. And you know that and the love that I'm talking about is not materialistic. Love is actually spending time with your child and talking to your child and giving your child an outlet. Um, another thing that I didn't mention is we as adults have to teach our children how to make how to make decisions. We have been told over and over again, and it's been passed down that a child is supposed to do what we say do, regardless, and they shouldn't ask questions. Okay, I get that, but that's not what it's supposed to be. If your child asks questions, that is your opportunity as a parent to teach your child in the way that you want them to be taught. Um, for instance, I have a 12, I have a 13 year old, just turned 13, man, time flies. My son, he doesn't like to keep his room clean. So I don't have to use my, I'm your dad, you're gonna do what I tell you to do, 
or my machismo for Latin for, you know, I don't have to use none of that. So what I do is I've learned to use, utilize the questioning technique. And I noticed that once I started putting what I wanted my son to do in a question, it gave him the opportunity to think about what I was asking him to do. And so what, what I would do, say for instance, if he didn't clean his room, I would say, son, um, can you help me to understand why haven't you cleaned your room yet? So he would look and he would look at me and he would say, uh, well, I haven't done it yet. Then I would say, well, don't you think that you should clean your room up? And then immediately he knows that I want him to clean his room up. So he go clean his room up and then I would go check it and make sure he did it. So I allow my son to talk to me. I don't feel like I got to whoop him and I do not believe in whoopings. That's just my, that's my opinion, my professional opinion, in my opinion, because I feel like whoopings can break your child's spirit. I've never gotten a whooping that I felt that when it was over with, that I felt loved after I got the whooping. I felt like I wanted to die. I felt like I wanted to, like, it would be better for me to not be in this world. I am speaking to you as an at-risk kid. I have had a past as well as an at-risk kid. And I can remember exactly how I felt at that time. I can remember the things that I wanted, that I needed, and, and, I, and I wasn't able to get it at that time. But I remember exactly what I needed. One thing I needed was someone to love me and not ostracize me for feeling or thinking anything. I need someone to be open to listen to me, you know, to, so I so that I could feel valued. I needed, um, I didn't need a whooping. I didn't need that stuff. They didn't, whoopings don't, don't, um, whoopings are not a gauge of success. Because I know it's a lot of, uh, several people that will say, well, if I wouldn't have got those whoopings, then I probably would have been in jail or been in whatever. But the other argument is, if I wouldn't have got those whoopings, maybe I'll be more mentally healthy. You know, it's it's very it's it's a it's more than a scratch the surface type of situation. When you're parenting kids, it's very imperative that they can respect you as you respect them. And so what I'm gonna do now is I could go on and on. So I don't know if we're gonna take questions or how we're gonna uh, do this. Yeah, actually I've got a couple of questions really quick, Clint, that I'm gonna ask and we're gonna switch over. Uh, to the Zoom chat and let some parents get at you real quick. Okay. Um, actually, maybe I should save my questions for that chat. Okay. Hold on. I've got a bunch, so maybe I'll ask a couple now. Um, you've used the phrase um, break a child's spirit a couple right. of times. Right. Can you define that, what that means? Breaking a child's spirit is um, it's like we it's like we our spirits is, is like our personality or how, how we are. Um, when you break a child's spirit, you make that child not want to exist anymore. You make that child um, doubt themselves. The child have self-doubt. The child don't, doesn't have the confidence to, to, to do anything. The child doesn't believe in themselves. And you, it's just a time bomb ready to go off. Um, you make the child antisocial. You make that child, some children uh, experience high levels of stress, which can be PTSD. I know that we don't like to, you know, use that type of talk, but PTSD happens. Uh, it's PTSD is an extreme fear. Um, anytime that you are parenting someone out of fear, you know, you, you just really can't control the outcome. You can't control the outcome. But when you are able to speak to your child in a way that you're speaking life, I, I assure you, I've had several mothers that I've spoken with and worked with that will vouch that the system that I put in place has really worked. And even for their sons, their sons that came back to me and, and gave me the, the feedback that it feels better when mom is able to ask me a question because when you ask questions, then it gives you a chance to think about what you want to say. And then you don't come off as aggressive or uh, it does, and it's less stressful as a parent is less stressful when you are able to ask a question. So breaking the spirit is, is, is the same as like the same way if you break a horse, you know, if you break, if you, if you break a horse, that horse is no good. You know, you might as well put that, put the horse down if you break it. So our kids are not horses. Our kids are a part of, is, is 
are the reason for evolution. Our kids have the uh, capacity to make our, our society a better place. As long as we, as parents, are doing what we're supposed to do mentally and physically. You mentioned uh, making, allowing kids to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. For parents who really struggle with that, mm -hmm. how can, what can they do to like kind of relax into that? Well, like, if um, that makes that question make sense. First, you want to, I want you to take, when it comes to, when you're in that type of situation, take a couple of breaths. If you need to walk away and then come back to it, then do that as well. Um, but I will practice being patient. I will practice being patient across the board. In every aspect of my life, I will practice being patient because that's what it's going to take. I told myself, even with my son, like, another reason why I don't really, you know, it don't bother me as much is because I've already told myself that I'm going to have to repeat myself over and over again. And I'm here to tell you, as long as you have kids, even kids who turn into adults, they still are kids, you are still going to have to repeat yourself over and over again. So be prepared to repeat yourself over and over again. And one day the kids are going to realize what you meant, but you're going to have to repeat yourself over and over again. Um, we're supposed to train our kids or teach our kids, uh, instill those morals and values in our kids. And um, if they, they, if we got it, we're going to instill it inside of them. But as parents, we have to give them the chance to use what we taught them. If, tr if they don't know, if they don't know what we taught them, I promise you, these kids will come back to you as long as you have established a relationship, a healthy parenting relationship with them. How do parents, I really like what you said earlier about mutual respect. Absolutely. And how it's got to be fostered. Right. right. For our parents that may be watching who have older children, maybe adolescents or 20-somethings, mm -hmm. how can they begin to build mutual respect with that in that relationship if they, if they feel like maybe it's been too late? It's not too late. What you have to do is you have to hold yourself accountable. You have to let your child speak to you about the childhood that they have had. You have to listen to them. So they let them, and then once you listen to them, admit where you have had fault, apologize to them, and work on moving forward. Uh, last one, and then we'll switch over to the chat and see if anybody wants to, to do a little bit of a meeting here. Um, how important is it for parents who have experienced their own emotional issues or traumas to get their own help? It is extremely, extremely important because if you don't get help, it's, we call it unfinished business in counseling. You're going to pass unfinished business down to generation to generation, and you're going to be in and out of relationships. You're going to be in and out of relationships. You're not going to have a healthy relationship until you start to work through the issue that you have on your own. So I highly recommend uh, counseling for those who have experienced trauma. I mean, I, I get, I understand that there's a stigma, but I promise, and I, and I want to break, I want to say this. I want to apologize to the people who have in, encountered um, people who didn't have the credentials, who used to utilize the name counselor that wasn't counselors, I want to apologize to you because I, I feel like, you know, it's not fair. And counseling is is a very important uh, field. You know, it's, it's the same. There is no health without mental health. Without your mind, you don't have your body. Your mind tells your body, tells your body to go. Your mind sends signals to your body to react to certain things. So I want to apologize for those who have had a negative experience with Trump, with, uh, with counseling, I want to apologize, but I will promise you this, that um, any counselor that you may come across, um, I know we worry about um, you know, telling your business, but we are buying by HIPAA laws and those laws are laws of confidentiality. That means you can go to your counselor and say any and everything and he or she cannot c disclose any of your sessions to anyone. So I encourage that, you know, get, get some counseling. It, 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 it will work. All right. So I'm going to do two things. 
going to recapture the video for a second. All right, um, so thank you guys for joining us for this live stream portion. What we're going to do is we're going to end the live stream portion. I am going to comment right now on the Facebook thread. Um, the Zoom ID and password for our post meeting kind of virtual roundtable or virtual chat. Please join us there if you're watching on Facebook. We'd love to see you. We'd love to interact with you that way on Zoom. If you're currently uh, in the Zoom meeting, let me put that in the open chat so that you can write down this Zoom ID for the virtual chat. And while I'm thinking, dear parents, moms and dads, stop taking your hurts from your partner out on your, your, out on your child. Stop taking your hurts out on your child. Your child did not ask to be here. Your child parent, do not speak negatively of the other parent. Uh, if you're in a single parent home or your know, dad is even a vet, uh, uh, in the home, do not speak negatively about your child's father or mother in front of them. Matter of fact, don't do it at all because it's not helpful or beneficial. In fact, it's hurtful. That makes the child feel like there is something wrong with him or her. It makes them feel like, you know, a part of them is terrible. So please do not speak ill about um, your, your child's mother or father in front of them, grandmother and all. Do not speak ill about them. And do not take out your frustration from a past relationship on uh, your kids because then you make them defensive. And once you make a kid defensive, they will not listen to nothing you say. So be sure to make sure that you're open for communication and um, you don't make them, do not make them, uh, defensive. All right. So we're going to switch over to our post meeting chat room. Uh, we will see you guys there. Be sure to join us two weeks from tonight, right here on Facebook live. Um, April 20th, we're going to have um, a great speaker bringing some information to us about what parents need to know. Um, about marijuana and medical marijuana. So we'll catch you guys next time, but hopefully we'll catch you here in just a moment in the next Zoom room.